And John, I'm like you, loosed in that verse just makes me raise an eye. I don't know if that is grammatically correct. I'll check with the powers that be. But um, it's in there and that's the way it is. It? it may seem awkward. What we have bound on this earth shall be bound in heaven. What we loose on this earth shall be loosed in heaven. As you notice, as you probably pulled in this morning, uh, our marquee reads, which weeks in the year have a first day of the week? Or which weeks of the year have a first day in them? There are two answers that I will accept. Number one, 52. And number two, all of them. Whichever one you feel safe and secure with the standing at. Psalm 122, 1 reads, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 reads, But the hour comes and now is when true worshipers, and there's the emphasis for you, true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father, look at this, seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, when God designed our worship for us according to the Word of God, He created such a simple plan for us. There's nothing elaborate that would cause us to have a difficulty in worshiping Him. He has basically made all provisions in everything. It's amazing that everything that we need to worship God in spirit and in truth can be found in every corner of the world inhabitable by mankind. And more interesting is that with the advancement of man's technology, we can take our worship to God in more uninhabitable places. The Arctic, the desert, even the moon. The first Apollo trip, they had communion service on the moon. It's pretty hard because you don't find any fruit of the vine growing around there. So mankind has advanced with our technology and because of our advancements, we can worship God in every corner of the universe that He has provided for us. Most importantly, God kept His part of our worship simple. He is here with us. He kept our part of the worship to Him very simple. Study His Word. Sing praises to His name. Pray to Him. Give accordingly to support His body, the church. And remember the Lord's death until He comes by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, since we sing praises to God without instruments of music as uh, given in the Bible, all we need for undefiled worship to God is the Word of God, some unleavened bread, and the fruit of the vine. And you can worship God in hidden catacombs beneath the cities of the Roman Empire. You can worship God inside a building, outside a building. You, like I said, you can worship God on the moon. Unfortunately, what God has delivered to us as pure and undefiled, mankind has this unbelievable way to distort, to twist, and misinterpret. Look in your Bibles in the book of 2 Timothy. Let's consider the verses in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boasters, proud, blasphemy, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, 
having a form of godliness. Now here, here, we, here we start focusing in on what I want to address. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive of gullible women loaded down with, um, with their sins, led away by various lusts, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now as James and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be made manifest to all as theirs also was. With this we see that we are faced with various divisions concerning what we are commanded to do 52 weeks a year. Man brings things to worship that God doesn't allow. Man takes things out of worship that God commands. And man changes how, he, how God specifically designed us to worship Him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Whose sight? His sight. This goes back to the age-old question, who are we here to please? The Lord or ourselves? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but you, you be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. According to Dave Miller's book, Piloting the Straight, mankind worships in one of four categories of worship described in the New Testament. The first that we could identify would be called ignorant worship. Uh, Paul has this encounter with the uh, Greeks in Acts chapter 17, verse 23. When Paul comes up to Mars Hill, he says, For I passed by and I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. See, so mankind can worship without understanding why they worship or what they worship or in this case, even who they worship. Ignorance is not stupidity. Ignorance is just a lack of knowledge. It is our goal and desire then to teach someone who is in ignorant worship what they need to worship in spirit and in truth. But additionally, Brother Miller also says there is vain worship. According to Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Anything that we do that is outside of what God has commanded us to do is vain worship. It is worthless. It is empty. The Greek translation of the word it simply means emptiness or nothingness. It is of no value. Thirdly, there is the will worship. Uh, mentioned in Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 and 23, Wherefore, if you are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinance? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which to all men perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. In other words, we're here to please ourselves. We're here for our needs. We're here because we receive something from it. We get something from it. Not that we give. Praise to God. Not that we give worship to God. Not that we give our attention and our understanding to His Word. 
In other words, it's that selfish, what's in it for me mentality. That's real worship. What do I get out of it? That's real worship. But then there is that godly and that acceptable <laughs> spiritual worship. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth as He would have us to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but you, you be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that you may show or demonstrate, the word prove, show or demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice, of God, the will of God, not the will of man. John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and those that worship Him must, and emphasize that word, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In considering this, our worship to the Lord, we must first consider how the Lord desires us to worship Him. So many times since I have been taught the Word of God, I have had people come up to me and say, why should I come to church? Why should I come to church? Why can't I get what I need at home? Or why can't I get what I need by myself? Why come to church? Well, the church comes to worship, first of all. Let's correct our understanding of that. This is a nice place. It's dry. It's warm. But this is just a building. The church comes to worship in this building. But ask yourselves, if we're coming to assemble, to worship God, why should we do it? First of all, we must have the proper attitude. The coming to God to worship Him in spirit. When we come together 52 weeks a year, we must engage our spirit in the worship assembly. In, in other words, we must be mentally and emotionally involved. We just don't go through the motions. When you partake of the bread and you partake of the fruit of the vine, that is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We sing songs of praises in preparing our minds for this moment of the sacrifice that the Lord and Savior gave us, that should touch your very soul. That is connecting with God in spirit. When the words are read, you are taking them in. It's not for your entertainment. It is for your education that you may connect with God in the Spirit, that you can grow so you can go out and you can increase the church by saving souls, which is your godly command. When we give of our givings and our collections, it is not of some, i got a couple bucks in my pocket. God says you purpose in your heart that you're connecting with your spirit. It is an emotional state. You're keeping someone fed that week. You're keeping someone from losing their power that week. You're helping someone spread the Word of God through the Gospel Broadcasting Network, through the International Gospel Hour, through Fabric of Family, through Good News Today. You're reaching and touching souls. Your spirit is engaged. You're not just chucking money in the plate. You're not occupying a seat. You're coming together to worship God in spirit. Why? Because we love the Lord. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We want to maintain the spiritual fervor that we possess when we obeyed the gospel from the start. Matthew uh, chapter 21, or sorry, 24, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because there's sin in the world, people become despondent. 
people separate themselves. How do we rekindle? How do we renew? We come together. There is so much more in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, than saying, Thou shalt come to church. Exhorting and growing together and uplifting. And so much more as you see the day approaching. Yes, we use that verse to say, not forsaking the assembly as is the manner of some. But exhorting and uplifting is so much more as you see the day approaching. We're engaging our spirit. We're involving our emotions. We're falling in love with each other. And that's a commandment, brothers and sisters. Love one another as I have loved you. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your body, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is likened unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. If you take in mind that you love God first, you love others, and then you love self, put Jesus in there because Jesus is God. You've got that joy principle that you've heard me talk about before. You practice that joy principle. You put your heart and your soul and your body and your mind in that joy principle. You can't go wrong because you will have a desire. You will have that want to. I don't have to go to church. I want to fellowship with my brethren. And there's a massive difference between the two. One of the main reasons I can think of of why we assemble together we come together to keep a casting, and we come together to keep from casting a vote to closing the doors of the church. Hebrews chapter ten, verse twenty-five: Not forsaking the assembly as the, is the um, manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. If you're not here, and you're not here. And I'm not here. There will come a time that everyone will see that that exhortation and that love is dwindling. And they'll stop coming. And then the others will stop coming. And as the old joke goes, the last one out, please turn off the lights. So we're not just <coughs> provoking, or not, we're not just exhorting you and admonishing you to come to worship and to worship and assemble with the saints because that's the thing to do. Of course, it's commanded, Hebrews 10.25. But look at that one part of that verse, and so much more. You ask that person, how can you be so happy in this world with this economic strife and it's turmoil, and it's wars, and it's this is and it's that. How can you? Because I have a hope, and I have a peace that surpasses all understanding that this world can think upon the matter. Because when I come to worship my God, I know that it further secures my opportunity for eternity in His grace in the heavenly home. I have that peace that surpasses all understanding in spite of everything that's piled up upon me, upon all of the things that comes about. I want to go to heaven. And more so, I want to take as many as will go with me. We come together to keep from sinning, James 4, 17. Therefore, to him to, that knows to do good and does it not, to him is sin. God says time and time and time again when they come together on that first day of the week, as they came together on the first day of the week to break bread and to continue in the apostles' uh, fellowship and doctrine, as they came together on the first day of the week to give, as they came together, it was an expectation. Some of the things that we question 
in the Word of God was an expectation from the first century church. They did it because there was no reason not to do it. There's some things in the Bible that you just will not find. Thou shalt not. Because God would have you to say, why should I even question it in the first place? If God says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And then I heard some, and that settles it whether I believe it or whether I don't. One of the reasons, call it a selfish motivation, if you will, that I come to church, I worship with the saints, because I want to be here when the Lord comes. I want to be found in the family when the Lord comes. Jesus gave us a parable saying that if someone knew that they, the, the hour and the time that someone's going to break into your home, would you not prepare for it? Would you not get ready for it? So there is an hour and there is a time coming that God will call us all to judgment. The righteous and the unrighteous. The sinner and the saint alike. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. How do you prepare for something like that? By staying prepared. It's not anything that you can plan on. You can't put it on your, your Outlook Express calendar. You can't put it in your Rolodex. This is the day that the Lord will come. Week before, set a, set a reminder a week before. You can't do that. So you set a reminder a lifetime before. You constantly stay prepared. And then, here's the strange byproduct of that. Your spirit gets excited. The, your spirit within you gets excited as you see the day coming. It's not that you have to go to church or that you have to go to Bible study. It's that you get to. You have the opportunity to. I had an opportunity to speak with uh, one of the uh, former teachers in this system for years and years and years. And he was talking about a time that he had the opportunity to go to, to the eastern block of Germany when the wall was up. And he said that one of the differences, he was talking to the bus driver of this tour that he was in, and that the bus driver said, you know, he said, uh, he was talking to him, and he said, you know, I've got it good. Through communism, I have a, I have a job, I have a home, I have food, I have medical care. They provide for me everything. He says that the one thing that I would want is the opportunity to choose my ruler, to choose whom I serve under. And you have that choice each and every Lord's day. Each and every day you draw breath, you have that choice. Who shall you serve? Joshua stood at the end of his tour, at the end of his service to God, and at the end of his life, and he says, you know, choose for this day whom you shall serve, whether it's the gods of our fathers across the river back in Egypt, or the gods of the Amalekites who now in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is a choice. It is an opportunity that you take it is the bonding of your spirit with the Spirit of God. But along with our proper spirit, we must have an attitude. We must have the proper actions. This is worshiping God in truth. We do things God's way, not ours. First of all, our worship to God must be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14.40 asserts this. Let all things be done decently and in order. Additionally, our worship to God must be accepted by God. Hebrews 12.28 Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. So when we come together 52 weeks a year, what has God demonstrated to us through His Word that we must do? We must study His Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study, be diligent, to show yourself approved unto God. Be that workman who is not ashamed rightly dividing the Word of truth. 
We do not add to the Word of God with extra books like the Books of Mormon, the Catechisms, the Apocrypha, or any other sayings of man that is not of God. More so, we do not take away from God's Word by determining certain commands of God not to be observed each and every Lord's Day, such as the Lord's Supper. You know, the Restorationists had it right. No book but the Bible. No creed but Christ. No name but the divine name of God. We sing praises to His name. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, saying, I will declare Thy name unto my brethren, and in the midst of the church I will sing my praise unto You. We do not add to God's desired worship by adding instruments of music, clapping of hands, praise teams, swaying. You will find no authorization of this anywhere in God's Word because they were developed, conceived, and brought forth by men. We pray to the Father. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. Our prayers do not use vain repetitions. We simply talk to God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for but they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 4 give us our authorization and our description of how we are to give to support the Lord's church. As it has been given to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store as God has prospered, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whatsoever you shall approve by your letters, with them I will bring to you with liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, then they shall go with me. We do not have authority to continue the shadows of the old law by tithing. Like all ordinance of the old law, it was nailed to the cross according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. We are, we are commanded to give as we have purposed in our heart. And we're to be cheerful in our giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. And finally, we are to remember the Lord's death until He comes by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Richard gave a great presentation of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 30 as our partaking of the Lord's Supper. But you understand Christ commands this that we do it Every Lord's Day, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Please understand that we are not permitted to decide when we will or we will not remember Christ's death. And if you'll pardon my boldness, why would you not take the time to remember Christ's death when He comes? each and every time we come together. When we come together to worship God, we must remember to do things His way. The only way. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. One final thought. Remember who the audience is. Just because my eyes look this way does not make me any more significant nor insignificant than you. We are all worshiping together in spirit and in truth. This is an act of worship. You are just as much participatory in it as I am. I'm not here to entertain you. We are here to praise and worship God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things which are pleasing 
in His sight. And ask yourself, would God be pleased with our worship this morning? Did we do everything that He had commanded us to do? Nothing more, nothing less. And in whose name did we do it in? Our name? My name? Forbid it not, O oh Lord. His name and His name alone. As a preacher friend of mine always says, and I just love it when he says it, he says, ask yourself, when you come to worship, not when you have to go to church, but when you come to worship with the saints and you're there, are you standing on the promises or are you sitting on the premises? I just love that saying. Where is your attitude? Well, I just don't feel the Spirit. Then you're not engaging your spirit. I don't know the truth. Are you staying in it? Are you participating in it? Are you making it a part of your everyday life? And finally, are you being recognized in the worship service? John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. But the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Can we say we did that this morning? I say amen. When we come together 52 weeks a year, you will not find us deviate from this one inch, one iota. And Lord willing, when you worship with the bodies of the saints, whether it's here, whether it's down the street, whether it's in another nation or a foreign field, I pray to God that you see the same worship that you see here because let there be no division among you. Let us speak Bible things and call Bible things by Bible names. No book but the Bible. No creed but Christ. No name but the divine. But to be a part of the body of Christ, you must enter into the covenant of God through His death, His burial, and resurrection. You are obedient to the Gospel through your hearing of the Word and your believing of it, through your repenting of your sins, through your confessing Him as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and therefore being baptized, being obedient by immersion in water for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Have you done those things? If not, I'm about to give a time that the Lord would have you come and do that. But not just this time, any time that you feel the need to obey the gospel of Christ, the invitation is always open. God is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're here for you. We offer this opportunity. If you need to obey the gospel, there's no better time than right now. If you need to return to the truth, if you found yourself off the straight way and on to the way that leads to destruction, there's an opportunity to repent. Come home. Whatever you need, why won't you come forward as together we stand and sing this song in the church.